Hello, and welcome to today's online forum. My name is Kyle Johnson. I'm the Editorial Events Manager at the Chronicle of Philanthropy. We're excited for this conversation, and we'd like to thank Newsmatch for helping to make this event possible. I have just a few housekeeping notes to share before I turn things over to our host and panelists. Your audio, video, and chat are turned off to streamline the presentation, but we welcome questions at any time, so please submit those using the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as possible toward the end of the session. And finally, today's online forum is being recorded and will be available in just a few days. So be on the lookout for an email from the Chronicle letting you know that it's ready. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce our host for today's conversation, Stacy Palmer. She is CEO of the Chronicle of Philanthropy. So I will turn it to you now, Stacy. Thanks so much. Terrific. Thank you all for joining us. We have a wonderful crowd here and terrific experts. Uh, this is such an important topic, as all of you know. We're focused today on the ramifications of a lawsuit against the Fearless Fund, which was an effort to provide support to Black female entrepreneurs, and it's a case that has been closely watched across all of philanthropy. There's been a lot of debate and discussion about the case and its outcome but also a lot of misinformation. So today we've assembled a group of experts who can help you understand what's happening, sort fact from fiction, and get you the resources and hopefully uh, step, action steps that will help you in your role. That's why we would love to have your questions because we wanna make sure that all of this makes a lot of sense to everyone who's on this call. I'd love to introduce you to the wonderful panelists that we have at the ready to explain um, and help you understand this case. So I'm gonna start with Roger. Hi, uh, Professor Roger Collinvo. Um, I'm a law professor at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. Uh, and I, I specialize in tax policy um, as it affects charities. Mark. Hi, Mark Philpart. I'm the executive director of the California Black Freedom Fund, which is housed at Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Carmen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Carmen Rojas. I'm the president and CEO of Marguerite Casey Foundation. Thomas. Hi, everyone. Thomas Sines. I'm president and general counsel of MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Educational Fund a national civil rights organization whose mission is to promote the civil rights of all Latinos living in the United States. And Olivia. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Olivia Sedwick, counsel in the General Legal Division at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law in Washington, DC. Welcome to all of you and thank you for participating. Let's start by talking about how we got here. Why was the your fun lawsuit so closely watched by everyone in philanthropy. And what does this decision to settle the case actually mean? Thomas, can you explain this to us? So the Fearless Fund case is a case that looks in some ways like philanthropy, though it is not, because the Fearless Fund was engaged in the business of handing out money. And a part of its mission, it's a venture fund, but part of its mission was to address the gaping disparities when it comes to investment in startups led by people of color. So Fearless Fund ran a, as one of its many programs, a contest effectively for startups, limited that contest to startups that were led by black women, and as a result was sued in a manufactured case by the opponents of affirmative action for limiting its contest to black women led startups. That case was brought under 42 U.S.C. Section 1981, which is a post-Civil War federal law still in effect that guarantees no racial discrimination, among other things, in contracting. The case was filed in federal court and ultimately resulted in an appeal on the denial of a preliminary injunction. That appeal led to a published decision, two to one by three judges of the 11th Circuit, in which the two judges in the majority concluded that a preliminary injunction should be granted and concluded not just that the plaintiffs have standing sufficient injury to challenge the Fearless Fund program in court, but also that the Fearless Fund program likely violated Section 1981. Therefore, they directed the entry of a preliminary injunction to stop Fearless Fund from continuing that contest. 
Of course, most recently, Fearless Fund settled the case and decided to end that uh, race-limited program that was only a part of what it does overall in support of its mission. So several things to emphasize. First, this is not philanthropy, though it looks somewhat like it. Second, it is a manufactured case, and there would have been issues, very significant issues, of standing. That is to say, whether the plaintiffs actually have a genuine and complete interest in participating in the program that they're challenging. And those would have been developed had the case gone forward were it not settled. Third, important to note that the Fearless Fund contest was very specific about being pegged to the race of the individual people who led the startup. And it's always important to note that under the law, persons, people have a race, but issues do not have a race. So for example, if Fearless Fund had instead run a contest for startups, part of whose mission was to address economic inequality in the Black African-American community, that would have been perfectly acceptable. But because it was focused not on the issue of addressing inequality in the Black community, but specifically on the race of individuals who led the eligible startups, it was more vulnerable than it otherwise would have been. I think these are among the important considerations as we continue to think about the Fearless Fund case and the decision that was rendered by a panel of the 11th Circuit. And this only applies in the 11th Circuit, right? Which is so just three states. It's important to note that that opinion does only apply in the 11th Circuit, which only covers three states in the South. Also important to note that it was a decision on preliminary injunction. So as I alluded before, had the case gone forward, a lot of the issues that were decided preliminarily would have been further developed and may have come out in a different direction. On the issue of standing and the sufficient injury to bring the lawsuit, there would have been an opportunity for the defendant fearless fund through discovery to question whether those who were being put forward to challenge this program had an actual genuine interest in participating and were ready to participate under all of the other criteria that were applicable. So that standing issue, just because it was decided in favor of the plaintiffs at this point, would not necessarily have ended up the same way. And the same is true with respect to the merits. The court well might have concluded as the case developed through discovery and other fact finding that actually there was not a violation of section 1981. And most importantly, it might have concluded that a First Amendment defense being put forward by Fearless Fund was a viable defense that protected it from being held to violate a federal statute, Section 1981. Now, important to note on that First Amendment issue, as I know we'll discuss further, here it was a little less, a little more attenuated than it otherwise might have been. If Fearless Fund had been funding the arts, for example, or had been funding public policy advocacy, two issues at the very core of First Amendment free expression protections, it would have been a much stronger defense. The problem here is that what Fearless Fund, a venture firm, was doing was effectively investing. It looks very much like a commercial transaction. So the First Amendment defects, defense was less vigorous for such a commercial transaction than it might have been for funding being given in other areas more core to the protections of the First Amendment. Thank you for explaining all of that. I think it's important for people to understand all those dimensions. Carmen, you work with so many grantees who are probably affected by the decision, the discussion, the discussion about the affirmative action case last year by the Supreme Court. I'm curious, how are your grantees seeing what's happening? Um, have they noticed a chilling effect? And have you made any changes at Casey um, that have been influenced by all of the legal things that have been happening. Thanks so much for having me, Stacey. I'm really so excited to be a part of this panel. Um, so at Margaret Casey Foundation, we have done nothing to change our institutional commitment to racial and economic justice. This means we talk explicitly about this commitment in our grant making, in our endowment investments, and frankly, like more broadly on in our institutional platform. I think as Thomas just noted, and as Roger really effectively uh, notes in his piece in the Chronicle last week, this decision uh, has nothing to do with the work, function, role of private charitable organizations. 
And until this politicized court actually makes a decision having to do with philanthropy, having to do with donors, uh, we will continue to use the full weight of our resources to advance racial justice in the United States by funding grassroots organizing that shifts the balance of power in society. I'll say, unfortunately, for the vast majority of our grantees, that has not been the experience, that there has been a chilling effect in philanthropy above and beyond what I think is kind of uh, like trophunctory or administrative changes to grant applications. Organizations led by Latino, Black, Native uh, individuals, regardless of what they are working on, have seen a decrease in funding. This is something that the Chronicle has written about, uh, as well as something that we've heard from grantees that in 2020, there was a blip that is a peak, it was like a one year peak in a, in a long history of philanthropic giving. Uh, and since 2020, there has been a marked decline. And I worry that in this moment, uh, especially for foundations, uh, and donors that made these commitments in 2020, they are preemptively cutting funding, having to do anything with justice. Like, let's not even talk about racial justice for fear of being targeted by Ed Blum or Stephen Miller in one of these lawsuits. And just to be clear, the people you just mentioned are the people who are bringing a series of lawsuits, That's not right. just against philanthropy, but in a wide range of areas. Yeah, right? I mean, they are mostly, tar we have in this moment sort of the confluence of a set of nonprofit leaders, philanthropic leaders, political leaders on the right who are working to attack the ability of organizations to redress rac past racial harm, of donors to give money to that kind of work. And uh, we're seeing it really effectively, right? Like in the last few months, a good number of organizations have received subpoenas uh, because of either giving on DEI or giving on uh, issues of uh, Palestinian solidarity. There is uh, a concerted effort by conservative forces to freeze the ability of donors and organizations to redress the harms of racial injustice, both in the U.S. and more broadly. So I'm curious what you'd like to see philanthropy writ large doing in this moment, and especially whether there are people or organizations that stand out in the way that you feel that they've responded to this moment. Yeah, I, you know, first and foremost, I just always am reminded that we live in a litigious society and people can sue you for anything at any given moment. And so be ready for a lawsuit. Like, uh, don't be afraid of it. You People sue people every day in America. And this fear and freezing around lawsuits feels absurd to me. And I think it's important to note that, again, Stephen Miller was able to raise $44 million in November of last year to sue institutions and organizations that have made a commitment to racial justice. And I think what is front of mind for me in preparation for this conversation and frankly in parts of other conversations that I'm a part of is that we need to see the resourcing of the legal organizing infrastructure for racial justice at the same scale. Like we can't be nickel and diming it and case by casing it. Like we need a full throated uh, uh, fight back strategy. I think the second thing is um, this real, I keep thinking about Tommy Orange's quote, of, you know, um, he wrecked that kids are jumping out of the windows of burning building, falling to their death. And all we think about is the kids jumping out of the window and not the burning building. This is part of a way larger strategy. And I worry that philanthropy can be uh, so fickle and sort of star issue starstruck that we see DEI as something that's standing on its own when in reality, anti-DEI groups know that this is a far bigger fight that is meant to dismantle both corporate policies and grant-making programs that have expanded rights and freedoms and opportunity to everybody in the United States. We're seeing this because they've made it illegal in many states to talk about race at school. They, have, uh, they are working to effectively eliminate the collection of data that helps us to understand the disparate impact of policies and, and investments, our dollars, right? Federal dollars, state dollars, 
city and county dollars, they're actively working to remove race as a consideration in data collection. And probably most harmful is their gutting of the Voting Rights Act. And so if we see this DEI attack and this affirmative action decision as a standalone, we are only talking about the kids jumping out of the burning building. And we aren't looking at the broader issue, which is the building is on fire and philanthropy needs to understand the full weight of this. And there are a couple of people in philanthropy that I think are just, uh, have led the charge. So, uh, you know, John Pousley at MacArthur really early on used the MacArthur platform to convene leaders so that we would have a common understanding of the problem, common language, alignment about what is happening. Recently, Don Chen has stepped into this convening role. And I feel like having space for leaders of philanthropic institutions to develop common language and a common understanding and collective action is really important. Lejeune Montgomery at Kellogg as well has been sort of a leading example of how you use the full weight of institutional resources. So actually talking to folks that do business with the Kellogg Foundation and pushing them to keep to their commitments. And so those folks for me are really key examples of what a lot of us in philanthropy should be doing instead of sort of shirking or hiding away, stepping up and stepping into this fight with the resources that our institutions have. Thank you. And thank you for those call outs. I'm sure there are others as well, but those are important people to mention. Um, Roger, you wrote a piece in our pages last week, really analyzing what happened, what philanthropy can do, what this all means. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a bit what your thinking is about the meaning of this case and what philanthropy should really think about next. Sure. Um, and thank you, Stacey. Um, and thank you for inviting me. It's really great to be a part of this panel um, and this conversation. It is an important one. So um, there's a lot going on in this case, uh, a lot of implications. Um, I think in the short run, um, for charities that engage in DEI efforts, it's likely to get worse before it gets better, uh, unfortunately. Um, and as Carmen alluded to earlier, the chilling effect here is real. Uh, and some of the chill comes from uncertainty. When the law generates uncertainty, then people don't know how to comply. And I think we're starting to see that now. Um, and, and nobody wants a lawsuit. So people are going to be cautious. Um, so I think we expect to see that more charities are going to abandon some of their programs, uh, DEI programs, especially those that are not central to their mission. Um, I also think we're likely to see some charities change the way they express their programs so as not to explicitly use race or other um, identity-based criteria in awarding charitable assistance, um, and probably also try to avoid uh, the contract form of assistance because Section 1981 applies um, to contracts. Um, unfortunately, though, I think that the 11th Circuit's opinion and the underlying logic applies very broadly. It's quite sweeping. So um, it, it, of course, covers contracts, but contractual assistance can include grants. It could include loans. It could inc include program-related investments. Um, so all of those forms of charitable assistance potentially are implicated by 1981, um, and I also have a, a larger concern that the logic of this decision extends to another civil rights provision called 1982, uh, which was enacted at the same time, and it requires essentially equality in dealings with property as property. Um, and if that law applies here, then you don't need a contract anymore. Instead, uh, you could target charitable assistance that is just the provision of cash or in-kind assistance directly, no matter what form it takes. So that's a, of concern to me as well. So uh, I think the short run, we're going to see a, a little bit more chill and, and a bit more uh, uncertainty. Um, in the long run, um, I am um, more optimistic and hopeful, uh, and that is because I do believe that the 11th Circuit decision is wrong, both on the law and on the policy. Uh, and before talking about that specifically, uh, I want to echo something Carmen said, which is to remember and take a step back 
to the catalyst for all of this, which really was the 2023 Supreme Court decision in the Harvard and University of North Carolina admissions case. Now that decision was very limited in scope. It applies to higher education admissions and it was a constitutional level decision, not ultimately a statutory based decision. And affirmative action in higher education also has a very long jurisprudential history. So the court wasn't writing in a vacuum. It has been thinking about this affirmative action issue for a long time. Um, now, notably, uh, of course, the court in that decision said absolutely nothing about scholarships or about privately funded charitable assistance. They were not at issue in that case. And so the court said nothing about them. Um, and certainly, to my knowledge, the court has never said that the provision of private charitable assistance in the nature of an affirmative action program is illegal. Um, that's not something the court has ever said. Um, and so this is where I think um, this is an opportunistic lawsuit, ultimately. Um, uh, but it's also where the 11th Circuit decision, in my opinion, is just off target. Um, so for one thing, and I know Tom has talked a little bit about this in his remarks, you know, the Fearless Fund case isn't traditional philanthropy. But at the same time, uh, there was a foundation here, which is a bona fide 501c3 organization and was providing charitable assistance. And in reading the 11th Circuit's opinion, you would have no idea that this was, in fact, a program that was run by a charity for charitable purposes. Um, and accordingly, the court really treated the foundation just like a business and applied this civil rights statute as if it was applying it to a business activity. Um, but it's important to remember that at bottom, we are talking about a privately funded activity by a charity that is designed to affect a real social problem. And now is where I just want to remind all of our listeners that there is a very strong tradition in this country on both the right and the left of supporting privately funded efforts to fix social problems free of government interference. That's what charities do. That's what they've always done. That's what we want them to do. Charity is a private space for innovation and for alternatives to government. Um, and consistent with that, since the 1950s, there's been a line of precedent that defines charitable and supports charitable efforts to eliminate the effects of past discrimination. And unfortunately, the 11th Circuit does not address or acknowledge um, any of this. Um, and my final point here is uh, to note that the 11th Circuit's approach also, when interpreting the statute, effectively ignores congressional intent. Um, and it is Congress uh, that writes the statutes and not the courts. And normally, when Congress passes a law, especially a civil rights law, there is a problem that Congress is intending to fix, a fairly specific one. But Congress has never said that private, private remedial efforts by charities to eliminate the effects of discrimination is or should be illegal. And there is no evidence that Congress ever intended for a civil rights law to shut down private charitable assistance. So I think it is a mistake to treat all forms of affirmative action the same. There's affirmative action in higher education subject to constitutional rules, but we're now talking about a private form of affirmative action in the charitable privately funded form. Um, it should be treated differently. And if the courts don't um, um, come up with, I think, a better and more appropriate interpretation of 1981, um, charities can take this fight to Congress uh, because ultimately it's Congress that decides. That's what I wanted to ask you a little bit more about. Is that where you think the emphasis should be on advocacy and working on the legislative side rather than so much of a focus on the courts? Well, I think that's a part of it, um, and it depends on on what future rulings, I think, come out of the courts. But I, I think there is a very, very strong case as a matter of inter statutory interpretation that this statute does not apply um, to privately uh, private charitable assistance. So it's getting the right sort of a, a test case, if you will, um, that that will show this and and finding and and providing sufficient funding for it. 
Thank you for explaining that. That's helpful. I want to remind everybody that we would love to have your questions. Um, so please be sure to start putting them in and we will get to as many of them as we can. Mark, I'd like to hear from you about the work that you're doing to help nonprofits and foundations better understand what they can do. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing? Um, and then we'll talk more about the resources that you have available that might be helpful to a lot of people on this call. Yes, thank you, Stacy, and thanks to the Chronicle of Philanthropy for hosting this important conversation. Um, as was mentioned, the California Black Freedom Fund uh, was really created uh, in 2020 to uh, respond to the racial reckoning and create an institution uh, that would keep philanthropy engaged in supporting the Black community and really doubling down on commitments for racial justice. Um, we started as a five-year initiative, as a project, essentially, and as soon as I started, uh, it was very clear that we needed to create an enduring institution uh, that would really be around for the long haul and support uh, the Black community to be more deeply engaged with philanthropy uh, for the long term. And the Black Freedom Fund has been on that journey uh, for the past couple of years, really trying to build an institution. And as we began to get into these conversations, uh, the SFFA ruling happened. And once the SFFA ruling happened, uh, it was clear to us that we needed to be paying more attention uh, to some of the issues that were being debated in the courts. Uh, we worked closely with uh, Adler and Colvin, a charitable uh, tax law firm, to understand some of the implications. Uh, and then they, in turn, engaged the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights to really help us think about how we structured our very own uh, practices as a startup fund. And within that process, it became so clear that the resources, the counsel, the advice, and the support that we were getting as a philanthropic institution was much more pronounced than what some of our community partners were receiving. Um, we had supported nearly 140 organizations throughout California, uh, investing $40 million in those organizations to build power in the Black community. And uh, when it came down to it, uh, many of them were left out of some of the, you know, kind of privileged conversations uh, that were happening within philanthropy. Uh, so we took our lead from uh, folks who had launched the Ready Initiative, uh, AFI, HIP, and NAP, and APIP, uh, really coming together to ensure that philanthropic leaders, as was mentioned earlier, led by John Palfrey and others, uh, to ensure that there was a common language and common understanding among philanthropy. And what we uh, decided to do uh, following uh, you know, our own experience was really create an opportunity for our community partners to have access to some of the same information, some of the same tools, and some of the same uh, uh, opportunities to kind of empower themselves around these topics so that um, their work uh, could really be defended and they are really positioned to be in a situation uh, where they can fight for uh, their work and be in more robust dialogues uh, with trustees, uh, funders and other leaders who were making critical decisions uh, about their funding and their resources and their needs without them. So uh, our work really began as a way to kind of democratize information and it quickly transitioned to a power building strategy. Um, we were quite clear that um, the number of legal attacks that were happening in California, while they're not as high profile, um, they exist and they deserve serious attention, uh, but they weren't the only ways in which uh, people were uh, facing threats. You know, the funding cliff uh, that Carmen has so eloquently talked about earlier uh, was something that was prevalently, prevalently impacting our organizations and we worked hard uh, to ensure that those organizations who 
were um, experiencing funders walking away from them during this really critical moment um, could have more robust conversations with those funders and really dispel some of the myths uh, regarding the legality of their work. And so that's where um, our work kind of evolved to. Uh, and we created Lead for Racial Justice um, as a vehicle uh, for us to be able to more intentionally uh, provide tools and resources and support to these organizations. Uh, LEAD is an acronym, Legal Education Advocacy and Defense. Uh, and that acronym uh, was really born from uh, our, our savvy marketing uh, team at Change Consulting, uh, who really saw this as an opportunity for funders to lead. Um, and so it was a call to action. Uh, and what we've done is create space for training, uh, development of tools, uh, technical assistance and support, and uh, pro bono counsel. Uh, and, and the important part for us is to have a really localized uh, set of offerings um, that would conform to understanding of California law within the national context, obviously, but also some of the dynamics that were unique and specific uh, to local funders and the organizations that they supported. And so with about 20 other funders, including the Latino Community Foundation, the Rosenberg Foundation, Tipping Point Community, um, and so many others, such as the Asian Pacific Fund, uh, we were able to come together uh, and create this set of resources and experiences for community organizations uh, to, to get the most out of uh, making sense of the moment and to uh, really come together in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, so the grantees from all of these organizations uh, have participated in trainings. Uh, so far, we've touched uh, 150 organizations, nearly 300 people, um, and the response has been tremendous. Um, people want to do more. Um, they've encouraged us to talk to their funders. And uh, the funders have also been receptive in part because um, there is a class of philanthropy that I think is um, often ignored. And some of the foundations in California don't have legal counsel. Uh, they don't have, uh, you know, uh, teams of law firms at the ready who can help them make sense of the moment. And they're subject to the misinformation that the public is subject to. And so really putting all the community partners and the funders in a position to be um, advocates uh, who have deep knowledge and understanding has really been the intent. Uh, and I think the outcome that we've experienced so far has been a groundswell uh, where people have really been able to push back um, they've been able to more deeply engage funders in ways that have resulted in them uh, breaking through and not necessarily having to uh, succumb to poor practice around these issues. Uh, and we're excited about the work ahead. And are people in other states modeling what you've done in California? <laughs> They, they sure are. I'm glad you asked. Uh, just this morning, uh, we were on with the Minnesota Council of Foundations, um, hosted by the Minnesota Black Collective, because they're organizing there uh, to replicate lead uh, in, Wash in Minnesota. Uh, in Washington State, uh, we're working closely with the Seattle Foundation and the BIPOC ED Coalition and others uh, to bring this model there. Uh, we've had conversations with funders in Oregon who are also interested in the possibility of replicating this work. Um, and so what we've tried to create is a very flexible grassroots model um, that can be applied in many places. Um, we need strong local partners, um, but we have this really dynamic combination of national legal partners, including uh, folks like the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, uh, MALDEF, uh, as well as pro bono local council uh, mm -hmm. that has been able to really partner and help us make sense of the state um, uh, civil rights law as it relates to the context of the federal law that's being contested in courts. Uh, 
We're so glad to hear all about that. And fortunately, we have Olivia from the Lawyers Committee right here. Um, and I'm going to turn to her next. And I will say that when we were talking about this conversation, um, she made it really clear why it's important to consult lawyers on this constant changing area. Um, so that's one of the reasons I want to round up with her, uh, because she has some important advice about given everything about how confusing the law is, all of us are trying to keep up with it, but lawyers spend their time day to day thinking about this. So I'm wondering if you can give us some practical advice about what nonprofits and foundations ought to be thinking about. So, um, first again, Stacey, thank you for having me. I think um, two things that organizations can be thinking about is one, um, the structure and function of their programs, right? So. Um, especially if uh, your program is designed to serve underserved communities, but um, you don't have a focus on race because there are some organizations that have uh, programs where the majority of their recipients um, are people of color, but their criteria, the process in which they go about um, making their selections is not hyper-focused or um, singularly focused on race. However, there are some uh, other organizations that are, uh, their programs are designed um, as remedial affirmative action type programs. Um, and so for those organizations looking at um, whatever agreements that you have, how they're structured, how they, how they function, um, I believe uh, Roger and uh, Thomas both made a similar point earlier about how um, lo looking at the limit of, of this, the fearless fund decision, um, but more importantly, looking at the intention behind you know, the, the money that's being given. So it's not a commercial act per se. It looks like a contract, but it doesn't necessarily function in the same way as a commercial agreement would. And so uh, because 1981 um, is focused on uh, principally whether there is the presence of a contract, um, what, you know, many would argue, at least from our vantage point is, you know, not just look at it in form, but also look at it in practice and function, what is actually happening. Um, and um, all of that to say that um, looking at what you're asking participants to do, um, if you're asking them to give up any type of rights or obligations or licenses or, or protected information that they otherwise wouldn't be giving up had, you know, unless they signed that agreement, that will make that agreement look more contracty, for lack of a better term, um, than an agreement that doesn't ask for any of those things or makes those types of things optional would. Um, and so that's, as you mentioned before, is why you consult your lawyers um, and you consult your lawyers on the front end um, as you are developing these programs, as you're just structuring um, these agreements, um, not just going in to say, well, we need this, we need this, we need this, we're gonna make you sign the dotted line in order for us to get all of that, in order for us to make, you know, make an advancement in this pro program, you have to be very, very thoughtful about how you're going about it. And so that's why you engage your lawyers early. Um, if you don't have um, access to counsel, figuring out ways to rely on your network to um, gain access to counsel, um, and that is large in part why uh, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law uh, stood up a program following um, the Students for Fair Admissions decision last summer um, around this time last year, the Protecting and Advancing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion initiative was uh, started at the Lawyers Committee. And through that program, we serve nonprofits of all sizes. Um, and um, most of them, if not all of them, are under-resourced organizations that don't typically have access to lawyers. If they have lawyers, they might have one lawyer on their team. Um, but we work with organizations to review their programs under federal law and state law. We get them paired up with a uh, pro bono law firm within our network of private law firms. Um, so they not only have access to 
expert civil rights attorneys through the Lawyers Committee. They also have expert uh, access to um, expert, uh, high profile expert uh, expertise, legal expertise um, through our law our law firm network. Um, and in that work, we've advised organizations that give scholarships, grants, um, that get engage in charitable giving, that engage in other types of programs across um, industries, across the arts, across um, uh, CDF, CDFIs, just to name a few, um, are the, these, those are the types of organizations that we work with in order to make sure that they have access to robust legal counsel where our goal is to not make you change what you're doing. We're hoping to make you think more clearly and thoughtfully and, intent, and intentionally about how you're going about doing this work um, because we none of us would argue about the importance of the work. Um, the, the issue becomes if someone, uh, as Carmen mentioned, Anybody can sue anyone um, in the United States at any time for any reason, uh, no matter how frivolous. And so, you know, in that, um, to the best way to defend yourself against that is to not be afraid of it and to not um, uh, curl back your activity because you're worried that somebody's going to sue you. You have to be armed at the ready. And part of that armor is ensuring that your programs are structured the right way and um, structured in such a way that, um, you know, a court now, um, I'll save my commentary on that for another moment, but that a court would be able to evaluate it under the law. And 1981 is the law of, is the, the flavor of the week for now. Um, you know, if it's being analyzed under under 1981, they're going to look whether there's a contract, and then there's they're going to look whether you know race is the principal driver of decisions under those agreements. And so, you know, the the problem is um, this law, the, this area that the application of 1981 to um, charitable giving is unsettled, quite frankly, um, and as uh, Roger mentioned, there is the propensity that any of these legacy um, reconstruction era statutes could be utilized to, in, in the improper way to um, advance an anti-DEI agenda. And so what we've been doing at the Lawyers Committee is, you know, putting our heads together with other organizations that we're in coalition with to really, you know, brainstorm and, and guesstimate and, you know, try to develop legal strategies in the event that, um, you know, Ed Bloom and his cronies decide that 1981 is no longer the flavor of the week if they decided they wanted to go at it from 1982 or 1985 or you know, any available uh, statute, shoot, they might find a, a way to reverse engineer Title VII to utilize Title VII, like, because in their mind, there is no, there is no boundary. And there, they will take and take the law and manipulate it in such a way that will advance their agenda. And so our job is to ensure that we are um, taking all the precautions necessary to to strategize around that. Thank you for explaining all of that and also for the work that you're doing on behalf of so many nonprofits. Could you quickly, you just went through a bunch of laws and titles and things, um, just generally what, you know, what are those topics focused on? Sure. Um, and before I get there, I, I will, uh, I guess, contextualize the SFFA decision because I think there's a lot of confusion around that too. Um, especially as it relates to the charitable giving um, industry. So uh, SFFA, again, uh, Roger said earlier, higher education uh, decision limited to higher education um, only. It mentions nothing, not only of, about uh, charitable giving, it says nothing about employment. It says nothing about um, uh, uh, recruitment. It says nothing about uh, uh Financial, the financial industry, it says absolutely nothing about anything else except higher education. But there, um, the the principles from that case um, have been taken and and are being waved around like a banner to say 
now, you know, there is no, um, the constitution does not permit any type of uh, uh, remedial uh, racial consciousness. And that's just not true. Um, the 14th Amendment, the 13th Amendment, the 15th Amendment are all Reconstruction era constitutional amendments that were enacted with the purpose of remediating the effects of slavery. And so from that, you have, um, you know, we all know how it goes. Those uh and that um, amendments were enacted. Then you have 1981, all of the title, um, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which 1981, 1982, all of those statutes are part of that, um, that iteration of the Civil Rights Act. From there, you have, you know, black codes and all of these anti-black anti people of color anti you know it wasn't coined dei back then obviously but anything that would advance racial equity um those things were put in place in order to curl it all back and so we're seeing that emerge in a different way now um so because sffa does not speak to any of those things Again, it makes no mention of Title VII. Title VII is a part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which governs employment and it prohibits racial discrimination in employment. Um, Title VI prevents, uh, pre prevents and prohibits racial discrimination in um, government funding. So that's government contracting and um, anything, any organization that receives public funding cannot engage in, in racial discrimination. That's Title VI, also a part of the Civil Rights Act of, of uh, 1964. Um, you have um, any, any of the, the the statutes that speak to discrimination. That um, helps us understand that a lot. Thank yes. you for explaining that. Yes. I wanna to get to questions fairly quickly. So I'm gonna, but um, while I'm going to the questions, um, we have, um, the wonderful experience of having so many experts on this panel that I think Tom has a question for Roger, or at I, least maybe a commentary yeah. on some of the things that he said. And I'm going to go to the audience's questions while you two have a bit of a chat. I just I just wanted to make clear that it is absolutely true that the SFFA decision is limited to the context of higher education admissions, and really Ed Bloom and his followers are misusing that law to spark these lawsuits that come under different provisions of the law. But we should be clear that there are prior cases before the Supreme Court that relate to private parties engaged in remedial action. So the Harvard part of the SFFA decision is actually against a private entity, obviously. Harvard is a private university. That was under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In this case, the Supreme Court majority concluded that the constitutional standard and the Title VI standard are the same. So at least in the context of higher education admissions, we already have the Supreme Court saying that private parties also cannot engage in remedial action in higher education admissions. It is also true that under Title VII, going back decades, there have been cases related to private parties engaging in quote unquote affirmative action when it comes to employment, hiring and promotions. And the court has been clear that that, that is an application of Title VII and actually has made it quite difficult to engage in voluntary affirmative action measures as a private employer under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So to be clear, private parties do have a reason to be concerned. It, it is true this is untested under Section 1981, and that's what leaves an opening. But it's also the case that we should be talking about, as Roger indicated, legislative fixes. So getting a charitable exception to 1981 is something that has been talked about in the United States Senate. Now, we don't have a functioning Congress these days to actually move anything forward, but if we actually get there, then certainly that's something that will be subject to great discussion, whether there should be a legislated exception in 1981 for charitable efforts to address, to remediate existing disparities. And you will have some who will object to changing a longstanding statute like 1981 that goes back to the 1860s. Uh, but there will be many who will be in favor of that kind of exception, including, for example, Maldef. We would support that kind of legislative exception. 
absent that kind of legislative action, we are left with constitutional protections that are very real when it comes to overcoming a federal statutory obligation like Section 1981. So in addition to trying to get out of the contracting aspect that has been discussed, there is a First Amendment exception to Section 1981, almost certainly because this court has crafted such exceptions in other contexts, for example, the 303 Creative case, the Hobby Lobby case. So we know that that can be utilized. And that's where it really is important to assess through good consultation with a lawyer who knows the area of the law, uh, how strong your First Amendment defense may be. And in cases, as I said, that are at the core of First Amendment protection, it's gonna be at the strongest. Less strong, the further away you get from that core, because most likely the court is gonna decide whether what you're engaging in is actually core First Amendment protected activity or more like ordinary commercial activity. Thank you. And that actually answered, I think, a few of the questions that we have um, about some concerns about understanding um, sort of what everything means. There's also a question um, from the audience about whether you all think that it was right for Fearless to settle um, and why you think they did um, and whether maybe that hurt the field. Who wants to jump in on that? I, I'll start. You, you know, it's very hard to second guess when a party chooses to settle. And in this case, they had good legal advice, good representation. So it's very hard to second guess. Overall, we've seen a number of settlements, as you know, by a couple of law firms, a couple of corporations, now Fearless Fund, since the Harvard UNC decisions came out uh, last year. Overall, one might say that those quick settlements are harmful because it raises the fear factor which is what the folks who are bringing these cases really depend upon. They depend upon the feared factor. But in the end, folks have to make the smartest decisions for their own cases. As long as they have good representation and more on that in a second, I think we can't second guess. What we can say is the field as a whole needs to react to this increase in the fear factor by getting more information out, working more collaboratively to understand how do you prepare the best way for any potential challenge to put up the best defense and then making sure that people do have good representation. Now, in the cases that have settled so far, I would have to say there has been good representation, but we've got to make sure that that happens in the future because they will increasingly target whomever they view as the weakest potential defendant. And that, they're going to be looking for folks who don't have in-house counsel, don't have ready available outside counsel, pro bono counsel. And we didn't make sure that that's not true that anybody who sued in this field is gonna have vigorous, well-informed representation on the law when it comes to any potential challenge. This requires a kind of collaboration that is unprecedented, but increasingly necessary given the increased fear factor that we see. That's a really important point. Um, there's another question about, are there concerns that this decision could be interpreted to apply to other protected classes, gender or age or that kind of thing? Who wants to take that one? Olivia? Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, this yeah. is just like the easy, this is the starting point. This is the house on fire, right? Like uh, this is the first in a series of attacks that conservative for, uh, forces in the United States have been waiting for. They've been waiting for this opening. And I feel like after this, everything is up for grabs. I, I feel like we forget the ways in which DEI is not just about racial justice and people of color, but it's about folks with disabilities. It's about the LGBTQIA community. It's about everybody who's not white or rich or straight in this country benefiting universally from the set of laws and protections. And I feel like this was like the, the first thread to be pulled, but uh, I would, I, uh, I have no confusion about how, if this thread is pulled, we start to dismantle the set of uh, institutional infrastructure or uh, the network of policies that have been put into place to remediate past harm. Like these aren't like leg up policies, these are fixing past harm policies. And I feel like as philanthropy, we have uh, a real opportunity and and frankly like a need to have a clear 
uh, communications or narrative strategy. This is like the last thing I will ever say about narrative in my life. But I feel like we often fail at the narrative game and let them frame the, the conversation as if this is the leg up, this is the benefit, as opposed to this is remediating the fact that we have lived in this country with institutional slavery and Jim Crow as a, a longer standing feature for people than we have with a set of laws to protect everybody and make universal access to a set of policies and benefits that make people's lives better. That's just the truism. And uh, so, yes, I, I think that this is the first and it's not the last thing that right wing forces are going to attack. Thank you for that. And I'm going to take us to a really practical question that I suspect is from a fundraiser who's listening to this and thinking about um, what might come next. Many charitable gifts are accompanied by a gift agreement, which is a contract. Do you think those are still different from commercial contracts? I would say, again, I, I, I can't. Every agreement is different. Um, it's like, I always say it's like a snowflake. Um, you know, there you agreements are, are unique to the people that enter into the agreement, the parties that enter into the agreement. So without looking at what um the 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 agency in this question might be referencing, um the it had in a in a gift agreement, the donor the donor the donative intent has to be there, right? Um and it the characteristics um, that really kind of come up, come into play or come into question in these types of cases is really the, the question of the presence of consideration. Is there something there where uh, the person giving the gift or giving the, the object of the agreement um, is receiving something in return for giving that, right? Um, or is the person that's receiving the gift incurring some type of obligation or 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 giving up a a right to do something um and so that's what we have to look at to determine whether you know that agreement the gift agreement is actually a gift agreement or if it is a contract that is more commercial in nature remember you can call it anything um but a court is going to look at a court will indeed look at what you what you title it, right? Like we saw that in the Fearless Fund case, like you know whatever one of the yeah. one of the documents said, this is a contract, like you know stuff like that isn't going to be helpful. But um, that being said, if you look at you know what what the parties are being asked to do or give up, that is where you're going to get to the, the key issue. Uh, That's helpful. Um, hey, Tom, I'm going to sort of start where we began a little bit and also something you said when you did a forum for us last year um, on the um, Harvard and UNC cases. Um, folks are confused a little bit about what you mean about people versus the cause. And could you explain that issue of, you know, how you can think about structuring these things in a way that makes sense but still achieves your goal? Mm -hmm. Sure. And I'll give the example I gave a year ago, which is <laughs> MALDEF, uh, as a part of our mission, awards law school scholarships. Now, the original intent was to create a greater pipeline of Latino and Latina lawyers to do civil rights work. But for over 30 years, we have not restricted our scholarships to Latino or Latina recipients. Now, that's the race of a person. However, we do make the major criterion for getting a scholarship a demonstrated commitment to serving the Latino community when you graduate from law school. That's an issue or a subject matter. It does mean that our scholarships have also gone to white recipients, black recipients, Asian American recipients in the past, a small number of them. All of those people had that demonstrated commitment to serving the Latino community. The difference is that the scholarship is now open to people of all races. It is not race specific or race exclusive. It's open to everyone because any person can have that demonstrated commitment to serving the Latino community. It's like the example I gave previously, a fearless fund had instead of saying we will only fund startups led by black women, instead said we wanna finance startups who have as a part of their mission to address economic inequity in the black community. 
that would open it up to startups led by white men as well as others. And that's the difference. So the difference is between basing something on the race of a person, CEO or the lead uh, in a startup versus basing it on an issue or a subject matter, even if that issue and the subject matter focuses on a particular community, because the difference is it's then open to people of other races. I just wanted to add uh, one more thing, which is I wanted to make sure that the question prior to this was not about thinking that the contract from your donor is going to protect you from Section 1981 liability, i.e. you have a donor who says, I give you this money to engage in race-specific grant making solely to organizations led by people of a particular race. And I just want to caution, it likely would not protect you because that's just a contract that's prior to this. It's not a defense against a statutory violation of Section 1981, unfortunately. So I just want to make sure that that caution is there. Thank you. And I am so sorry that we have come to the end of our time together because there are a million questions and each of you has a ton of things to talk about more. Um, we could have this conversation all day. So we will try in our coverage to follow up on many of the issues that were raised here. A recording of this conversation will be available to you very soon. I want to thank our amazing panelists, Roger, Mark, Carmen, Thomas, and Olivia for all of these remarks today. And I want to thank Newsmatch for supporting this and making this possible. Thank you, everybody, for participating in this. Um, and do let us know how we can continue to serve you and answer your questions. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.